Tēnā koutou katoa, and thank you, Paul. I get the, have the great pleasure at introducing uh, tonight's speaker, Professor Joe Bowden. Uh, Joe was brought up in the US, for those who don't know, and I think we're going to hear more about his early life uh, in his talk. Um, he went to university first at the University of Boston and received a BA in psychology in 1988. He then went to Cincinnati to Cape Western Reserve University, where he uh, obtained an MA in psychology in 1993, and then PhD also in psychology in 1995. The next 10 years were characterised by some movement around the globe, um, postdoctoral training at the University of Virginia, a lectureship in the UK at the University of Plymouth for moving to the Southern Hemisphere and the University of Southern Queensland uh, for another lectureship. Now I had to look up where the University of Southern Queensland was and for those who don't know it's in Toowoomba which is west of, of Brisbane. And uh, having travelled with Joe in Australia, I mean that is the reason why he's a dual Australian citizen, which some of you may not know. He uh, moved across the Tasman uh, to brief positions at both Lincoln University and University of Canterbury before joining this campus and the Christchurch Health and Development Study in 2005 as a research fellow. He was promoted uh, to Senior Research Fellow in 2008, uh, re uh, Research Associate Professor in 2013 and obviously in the latest round to Research Professor. And during that time taking on increasing uh, leadership roles um, with the uh, Christchurch Health and Development Study first as Deputy Director and then as Director, which he, he now holds uh, that post. Uh, research interests, psychosocial causes and consequences of substance use, abuse and dependence, mental health and substance use epidemiology, social and psychological determinants of maladaptive behaviour, including aggression and violence. And I decided to try it out by putting his uh, publications into a word cloud um, program Obviously, the first, the major word was Bowdoin, but once we got rid of that one, <laughs> not surprisingly, alcohol, addiction, outcomes, cannabis, self-esteem, dependence, personality were the kind of prominent words. Uh, Joe's notable for, for, for many things. He's a highly productive uh, researcher, um, as is typical for, for uh, the unit that he works in, uh, approaching 200 publications, a large number of collaborations, um, and certainly Joe is, is known as a very generous collaborator. His recent, more, more recent work at the Science Policy Interface, and that's a, that's a space that not many of us go into very often, but is a very important one, and be able to navigate that is a, is a really vital part of uh, academia, and Joe does that very well, and not surprisingly, uh, and as a consequence, is widely sought after for media commentaries, explaining the science to public, and uh, is in hot demand at times, particularly when there's a, a, a cannabis referendum coming up. And also just a, a, a personal note as well, I think often service activities or some that we don't often um, acknowledge as much as we should in university, but Joe is, is a highly valued colleague for the, work he, the service work he does for this campus and the university and there have been many such activities and some of them quite challenging and, and as an example he uh, willingly, I say willingly, maybe not so willingly, he took over it. Well, as co-lead on our, our workspace user group for the building, which is one of the more challenging ones, has been absolutely key in that role and navigating, obviously, quite a, um, a, you know, a, 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 an area of great interest to all of us here, but been greatly appreciated. Joe uh, received our highest uh, got, um, research award, the Research Gold Medal in 2017. And tonight he's, he's going to talk about his background, the early interests, how they influenced his career choice, uh, talk about research on substance use, aggressive violent offending, and how his research has moved into the policy sphere. So um, welcome, Joe Bowden. Just testing if that's if it's working at the team. So you can all hear me fine. Excellent. Tanakoto <laughs> Katwa, thank you very much for coming along. 
this evening. Um, I certainly do appreciate it. One of the main problems that I had when I started to try to formulate this lecture was really down to the kind of work that we do at the Christchurch Health and Development Study. It is we're really about a method of studying people's lives over a long period of time, from birth now to, in our cohort, to age 43. And in doing so, we've got to look at a, a broad range of different topics. But sometimes we tend to do that in a little bit of a shallow way, possibly, as compared with, with some other researchers. So what I'm going to talk about today really are a, a bunch of things, um, a number of papers and projects that I found interesting and challenging over the years, um, and just give you a, a little bit of a snapshot of um, what it's like to, to, to do this over the years, um, and a little bit about myself, of course. Sorry, I'm really nervous. I don't get nervous before speaking, but today I am. And Bridge is here so she doesn't get fired. <laughs> brushing against it, and the words should be heard. Thank you. So okay. <laughs> Are we good now? You're great. <laughs> sure. I am great. <laughs> Lovely. So I'm from that little red dot on the map. It's a bustling metropolis called Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And I was born there at the end of 1966 to very young parents, 23 and 21. Um, they actually lived in the, in the town next door called Dalton, which was an even more bustling metropolis of 7,500 people. And um, as you can see, it's, uh, well, you can't actually, actually estimate that. That's about a three-hour drive from my hometown to Boston and about a three-hour drive from my hometown to New York City. So, well situated. Um, but when I was nine years old, um, we actually up and moved one whole mile to Pittsfield, um, where I spent the rest of my childhood, which I'll say more about in a minute. Now, my family has um, resided in Pittsfield for many generations and still does. So my parents live there, my brother and his partner, um, and my nephew. Um, but my ancestors actually have been in North America for thousands of years. So uh, some of my ancestors are uh, members of the Kanawake Mohawk tribe. Others arrived there rather later from Europe. But I'd like to focus on one ancestor in particular, um, and that is my great-great-grandfather, Nicholas Bowden. Now, Nicholas Bowden was born in a village just outside of Heidelberg in Germany in 1837. And I don't know that much about him, but what I do know is that when he was a teenager, he got on a boat and sailed to the United States. He landed in Boston and eventually, not long after, turned up in Pittsfield where he and his wife raised three children. Um, so that's the story of how my family got there. Now here's some pictures to, to look at. Um, my family are, are, I come from a family of very practical people. So my dad, and that's me in the red and white stripes there on the left. <laughs> that was taken about 1974. And my dad and my little brother, and that's my grandfather, George, who is Nicholas's grandson. <laughs> Very practical people. So my dad was a skilled machinist. Um, my grandfather started life as a professional musician, um, but eventually stopped being a musician and w ended up working on a, in, a, in a paper mill on a machine. My other grandfather was a welder. So really, my family didn't have a great deal of experience with further education or higher education, anything like that. In fact, I'm the very first person in my family to go to university, uh, and never mind get three degrees. <laughs> um, others later followed me, of course. Um, but I'm, I'm from this background, and I wanted to show you the picture of my grandfather because every, every lucky kid has a person when they're a little kid. That is, the person who means an awful lot to them, with whom they have a really close relationship, and who really sees them through, uh, sees them through life. And that, and that was my grandfather. Um, I was a bit of a bright kid, um, and my grandfather really encouraged this. He always wanted to know how well I was doing in school, what my assignments were, 
and we would read to each other and tell each other the jokes out of Reader's Digest and, and all those sorts of things. So really, um, I just wanted to recognize my, my grandfather because he's one of the main reasons why I'm, why I'm here today speaking to you. My family's always been supportive, even though they didn't have the background in this. Um, that was taken eight years ago, I think, when I was at home. Um, they did, although not having the background, they were always supportive of my endeavors. Um, I think they probably recognized that, that academic things were really the only thing I was good at, so <laughs> they wanted to push me in that direction, I suppose. Um, and, and so much so that, for example, my dad, um, you know, who was a very hard worker, would work 12-hour shifts five days a week and another half day on Saturdays um, back in the 80s. Um, and they, my parents took out a second mortgage on their home to ensure that I could finish my undergraduate degree. So I certainly owe my family a, a very large debt of gratitude. So that's me when I was 12. <laughs> The reason for this picture of me will become apparent in a moment. But in anticipation of this lecture, I asked my mother a few weeks ago, what was I like when I was that age? And she said, well, exactly what she, I thought she would say. She said, you were, you were quiet, um, you were studious, you basically read any book you could get your hands on. Um, and that really, I think, described me well. And what I remember of childhood was that the very first thing that I wanted to be was a scientist. No jokes about soft science, please. <laughs> I wanted to be a scientist, and the reason I wanted to be a scientist because my favorite TV show was Star Trek, and my favorite character was Mr. Spock, who was a scientist and who got to help his mates out. He was really, really smart and got to help his mates out. Because being a scientist is all about flying around in space with your mates having great adventures, isn't it? I would have thought that when I was five, but obviously this hasn't come to pass yet. Um, after that, I thought a little bit about, oh, maybe I'd like to be a writer. So I've done a bit of that over the years as part of this job. And then I thought for a while that I might like to go into medicine because I wanted to be Hawkeye from MASH for <laughs> obvious reasons. Um, but Obviously, these things did not happen. Uh, what I did do when I was 17 years old, go down the road to Boston, to Boston University, um, where I did, in fact, start that um, pre-med course, which lasted exactly one year, um, because I hated all my classes except one, and that was psychology. Uh, the study of human behavior absolutely fascinated me, whereas biology, chemistry, and calculus I thought were terrible. So <laughs> I decided instead of that, and I wasn't doing well anyway, I would do psychology instead and work toward the psychology degree. And when I, I got that in 1988, and what happened is I, I went to work in a non-governmental organization that um, specialized in residential mental health treatment for people with very severe um, and long-lasting mental illness, primarily schizophrenia, but a number of other disorders as well. And it was really, really hard work and really emotionally draining. And about a year and a half into it, I realized that I probably wasn't cut out to do it. <laughs> um, so with the help of a couple of friends who were doing their PhDs at BU, I en ended up applying um, to do that. I thought, well, I've got a psychology degree. Perhaps I could be a professor. <laughs> and um, moved, moved to Cleveland, to Case Western Reserve. Um, where you see me um, walking through graduation there um, after I received my PhD in 1995, and that is a ponytail, if you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the, the biggest breaks of my life was in 2004, was being hired by David Ferguson and John Horwood to, do, to be the new research fellow at the Christchurch Health and Wellness Study. Um, that apparently the HR office nearly lost my application. <laughs> so it came close, but I did get the job, and it was really one of the luckiest breaks I ever got. In my previous life, having studied as an experimental social psychologist, I spent a great deal of time doing theoretical work or torturing undergraduates, that is, putting them into experiments where I would show them unpleasant things and, and all those sorts of things. But it didn't have a lot of ecological validity. There wasn't a lot of the real world involved in what I was doing. And that's really, to me, 
one of the most important things about being able to do this job is, is having real world data to hand to look at um, problems that people are really suffering from. And the first area that I want to talk about are drugs. Now, I became interested in drugs, not for, the, not for any reasons that you laugh about, but growing up in the 70s, adults were really preoccupied with young people taking drugs. And so we have things like, on the left is a panel from a comic book in 1970 that said, kids who take drugs are losers. Well, way, way to shame people. <laughs> Or, or speed kills, that came out later in the 70s, um, to try to frighten you. So the adults were very preoccupied with this idea of drugs and drug taking. And, and they seemed to spend a lot of time and emotional energy on it. So it set me to wondering, being a curious young person, what is this, what is this all about? Um, and in fact, one of the defining experiences in this was um, when I was a kid in our old house, um, we had a big kid who lived across the street. I say big kid, he was probably about 18, um, but that we were afraid of him, vaguely afraid of him. Um, his name was Pat, and one day there was a terrible commotion outside, and we looked out, and there was about 10 police cars surrounding Pat's house, and they were leading him out in handcuffs. Pat was a drug dealer, and he just got arrested. And that day, my dad said, we're moving to a better neighborhood. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> I had the police thing in there just to remind me to tell the Pat story. So I was very interested in all of these things. But there was no real source of reliable information to a young person, or I didn't know of any. And certainly, the adults didn't want to talk to you about it. They just wanted to say, don't, don't do that. So I did what any other smart kid would do, and I went to the library, <laughs> school library in this case, and I took out this book. Now, I actually own a copy of this book now. I bought it in anticipation of this lecture last year. See how confident I was? <laughs> <laughs> it says, it's what you, what you should know about drugs and drug abuse, and it's written to young people. So, you know, people 13, 14 years old, and I was 12 when I read it, and I must have read it 10 times. And it, it's incredible. It has a huge amount of information about different drugs, what they do, how dangerous they are, what are the, and, and all of these things that answered all of my questions that I had as a, as a curious 12-year-old. Um, and it was, it, it was really a, a godsend in that sense, but I think really a, sparked that interest, that scholarly interest in this particular topic. But I didn't really get to do too much with that until the CHDS. Now, one of the first tasks that David Ferguson gave me in terms of papers to write, and this was how David worked, he, he said, well, I've got an idea for a paper and this is what we're doing, is we wanted to, uh, to be able to uh, look at the prevalence of illicit drug use in the CHDS cohort as an updated sort of thing. He had written a paper about it earlier, but we wanted to update it since we had um, data to age 25. Um, so we set us to work on this task. Um, and just a few things to notice about this. So for example, we've got the cannabis use on, on the left. And when they were 15, there was just under 10% using. Um, but by age 18, that was half the cohort was the estimate for the number of people who had used cannabis at least once. And by age 25, that number had risen to 76.7. Now, the significance of this is, as you may or may be aware, I'm pretty heavily involved in the cannabis law reform debate here in New Zealand. Um, and one of the numbers that gets tossed around a lot inaccurately, I should add, is that 80% of Kiwis have tried cannabis. And where that number comes from is a rounding up of that number that I generated. So in a sense, I was very thrilled that people started using this and it became part of the discourse. It's not quite right, it's not entirely accurate, um, because really what it means is that 76.7% um, of 43-year-olds have tried cannabis, um, to be more accurate. 
Um, but it was very pleasing to, um, to be part of the discourse in that way. Um, and in, you can s see the other numbers as well. Now, it wasn't long after that, David came up with another really interesting idea. And I do miss David coming up with ideas. <laughs> um, which was one of my favorite papers of all time. Um, and previously, David and John had looked at the relationship or the association between cannabis use and other illicit drug use to see whether the extent to which, or try to quantify the extent to which cannabis could be a causal agent in other illicit drug use. Um, and so what we wanted to do with this paper is, first of all, update it using the age 25 data that we had. So we had 11 years of cannabis data at the time rather than the much smaller amount that they had used in the previous paper. But also for technical reasons. Because when we're talking about trying to model an association between an exposure, cannabis, and an outcome, other illicit drug use, we have to take into account factors that could confound this association statistically. Right? So things that happened prior to the exposure that could have caused both cannabis use and other illicit drug use. And as you might imagine, since we started the CHDS um, at birth and have measured many aspects of their life and family functioning and, and many things over the years, you might imagine that we have a huge range of variables that we can include in this kind of confounding analysis, and you'd be correct. The trouble is that there's always an argument in the background that says you can't have measured everything. That is, there must, be, there must necessarily be something there that you haven't measured and therefore haven't accounted for. So this was way back in 2005. And um, at the time, David had been using uh, a technique that was not well known, that well known in the literature had been used in e e uh, economics and other areas, not so much in epidemiology or psychiatric epidemiology. And that is a fixed effects regression model. And what this does, I'm not going to show you the math, so you don't have to worry about that. But what this does is it allows you to to control for no, all non-observed sources of confounding between that exposure cannabis and the outcome of other illicit drug use. So it's just a way of trying to have a more precise formulation of what we think that association looks like. So what I loved about this was, was while well, I was hired for the job because I had some, some quantitative ability, um, the first year of this job was like trying to s scale a sheer wall with very few tools um, in terms of developing my technique, but it was a real challenge and I enjoyed every minute of it, just about. <laughs> so what we found, and this is a real simplification, um, as you might guess, after we controlled for all non-observed sources of confounding and some time dynamic covariate factors, so things that occurred during that period 15 to 25, like life stress or affiliation with deviant peers, so people who do drugs and break the law, that sort of thing. Um, you still have a very strong association between cannabis use and other illicit drug use. So if you're a weekly or better cannabis user, and this is, these are fully adjusted models and aggregated over the period 15 to 25, your rates of other illicit drug use are 10 times higher than for people who didn't use cannabis. Now what this graph obscures is that there is actually in the data a very strong age gradient, such that when you're 15 years old, if you're a regular cannabis user, your chances of using other illicit drugs are 66 times higher than if you don't. Um, and then that gradient drops all the way to three times higher by age 25, suggesting that there's a, there's a, a a vulnerability for young people um, in terms of accessing cannabis and then having the ability to access other illicit drugs. But it was a, it was a lovely challenge. Just to change gears slightly, we'll t move to um, alcohol, which apparently, there we go. <laughs> I was not being heard. Which is also a drug, but legal. <laughs> um, and in the literature, there's been well known for a very long time that there is a reasonably strong correlation between having problems with alcohol 
and having symptoms of major depressive disorder. But what's not known is if there's a, if there's a causal association at work, which way does the arrow go? Does it go from having alcohol problems to being depressed? Does it go from being depressed to having alcohol problems? Does it go both ways? Is there a little bit of influence in both directions? Well, to address this problem, we, um, we fitted a structural equation model. <laughs> I knew there'd be a laugh. <laughs> the undergraduates get even more scared of this <laughs> when you show them. But it's really fairly, fairly simple. All you need to know about, um, we have alcohol on the right, and that is a latent, non-observed tendency to alcohol problems. We've got depression on the left, which is, again, a latent, non-observed tendency toward depressive symptomatology, which are correlated. That's the big bar at the bottom. But what you're most interested in are those pathways B1 and B2. And those pathways are measuring the extent to which alcohol causes, alcohol problems with alcohol cause depression. That's B1. And pathway B2 that we estimated is how much depression caused alcohol problems. And just to cut the story very short, the answer is it's the alcohol. <laughs> so we found a statistically significant pathway, uh, B1, such that alcohol uh, use disorder led to depression, but not the other way around. So the, the take home message for the physicians in the audience is if you've got someone who's got alcohol problems and they're depressed, get them to stop drinking. <laughs> So finally, for drugs, to leave time for crime, um, this is a paper that actually came out earlier this year, um, where we looked at, um, we took the cannabis frequency data. So for each year, we asked people, how frequently have you used cannabis in, in, during that 12-month period? And we took now, so that would have been 20 years of data, and aggregated that to, in order to fit latent trajectory models. So we wanted to find out if there were groupings within the cohort that could describe the progress or change of, of their cannabis use over their lifetimes. And of course we could, otherwise it wouldn't have got published. So as you see there, we've got non-users and occasional users. And, um, but what we're most interested in primarily, of course, are the chronic, long-term chronic users. And as you can see, they ramped up their cannabis use quite quickly. And they remained avid cannabis consumers, and they have done so throughout their lives. Right? These people are very interested in, in this sort of thing. And as you might guess, the rate of psychosocial problems in this group is a bit higher um, than it would be in the general population. So you see things like um, a history of school failure, unemployment, um, major depression, and, and some other things as well amongst this group. So while some, a number of them are engaging in their cannabis use unproblematically, there are higher rates of problems in the group. But what's probably a little bit more interesting is that orange group. And those people, um, when they started out life looking like the occasional users, but somehow around age 25, they suddenly begot, became interested in cannabis. And they started to approach rates of use that look like the long-term chronic people. And what's notable about this is a number of the predictors and risk factors are very similar. So for example, one of the predictors they have in common with the chronic users are, is school failure. But they failed out of school before they started using cannabis. So it suggests the possibility that some people who are adult drug users are actually selected into that drug use. I could talk about that longer, but I've run out of <laughs> time to talk about that. So to switch over to crime, really what I'm mostly interested in for, this, for, for, for these purposes is violence. I don't have a really funny or interesting story to tell you about how I got interested in violence as a topic, um, except to say that I was an undersized kid who was too smart for his own good and had a big mouth, which meant I got into lots of scrapes. <laughs> and they always left me very upset. And, but I noticed that some of the other kids actually didn't seem to be bothered by this. It was just a 
I don't know, a normal part of their day, and a number of them really enjoyed it, which was very paradoxical, and I, I couldn't quite work out why that was, and I think, again, sparked some curiosity about this. And the first time that I ever had a chance to, to study it was in the context of a very large project that I was lucky enough to be a part of because I answered the phone. <laughs> so one day, uh, my supervisor, Roy Baumeister, he was on sabbatical um, at the University of Virginia, and I happened to be sitting in the lab next to the phone. The phone rang, I picked it up, and it was Roy saying, I've got a project I want to do, and do you want to work on it with me? And I said, immediately said yes, and it was good that I said yes, because this paper has been cited now, it's almost 25 years old, it's been cited more than 1,300 times. And in fact, I have a citation alert, and every Friday, I get at least one new citation for the paper. 25 years, it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we did, and this is going back to being a social psychologist, which meant it's a, it's a theoretical work based on a very extensive literature review, which meant that I spent the entire summer of 1994 in the library, which was fine because the library was air conditioned. Um, but I did spend the summer in the library, and as you remember, hand trolling journals for articles that might that might have otherwise escaped your notice from the search engines and those sorts of things. And the idea that Roy had was this: he was a, a researcher in social psychology, the self being one of his major research interests. And in the 1980s. Social psychologists, well, this actually really came into to popular culture. Self-esteem was the thing in the United States. That is, it was basically the, the reason, if you had high self-esteem, it was the reason why you succeeded, because you had it, and why good things happened to you. And alternatively, if you had low self-esteem, bad things would happen to you. All number of bad things. So, of course, nothing really works like that. It's certainly not that powerful. But well, one of the things that we wanted to study was the fact, or, or statements about the, that self-esteem is related to violence such that people with low self-esteem are violent and aggressive. And this was actually believed at the time. And Roy said, let's, let's test this. Let's, let's try to see if this is true. And I can tell you, in the entire literature that I searched that summer, we could, not, we could find one paper that linked low self-esteem and violence. And that was a study of women who had been incarcerated for physical child abuse. And in these, th this determination was made when they were being interviewed just before they were released from prison. So of course they had been incarcerated for beating their children. Of course they have low self-esteem. They're not, <laughs> not going to think very highly of themselves. But we couldn't find anything else. And in fact, all we did find was examples from the literature of higher levels of self-esteem being related to violent behavior. So we came up with this theory, and Psychological Review is a, is a journal where you're allowed to do, a, where you're allowed to create a, theoretic, a theory based on a literature search. And it's a, it's a very long article. <laughs> so what we essentially theorized was something like this. I actually drew, drew this figure on an old Apple Mac in the mid-1990s, <laughs> and it appears in the journal article. So on one side, we have a, a favorable view of the self that's unstable, perhaps inflated, uncertain, a bit like a president we all know. <laughs> uh, and we have negative evaluations by others, like me. <laughs> um, and you have this discrepancy that's created this is what we call threatened egotism. And what happens if the person reaches a choice point, if they decide to reject the appraisal, one way that they can do this is if they have very strong negative feelings about this, is through violence and aggression. Again, fully theoretical, made it up in our heads, and it's still pulling down citations to this day. But what it needed, what it needed, was some empirical testing. Now, Roy and a colleague of his, Brad Bushman, did a study in the early 2000s where they looked, they undertook a laboratory exploration of this idea, which involved manipulating undergraduates into thinking something was true that wasn't, and, and all these things. And it looked like the hypothesis could be true. But again, it's a highly contrived laboratory situation with undergraduates who are not typical members of the public. And 
after I got to the CHDS, it became apparent that I could actually perform a much more ecologically valid test of this hypothesis using our data. And so we wrote this paper. <laughs> when the cohort members were 10 years old, and again when they were 15, they received a, a self-esteem measure. And now those data had just been, we're, we're in the data bank. But what we wanted to look at was the association between self-esteem when they were 15 and 10, and violent, self-reported violent offending, and also hostility as measured by the um, symptom checklist 90. And at the bivariate level, that is before you adjust for anything, it looked like low self-esteem was related to more violent behavior. But adjusting for conf potential confounding factors reduced this association to non-significance basically saying that this apparent relationship between self-esteem and violent offending was really due to all the things that could possibly lower your self-esteem and make it more likely that you're going to behave violently. Now, the, the association with hostility actually hung in there, suggesting that people with low self-esteem are hostile, <laughs> and they express hostility when they're asked to. Um, so that hung in there. But more, slightly more interesting was a way of looking at self-esteem stability. Remember, we had two measures. So we could look at people who had a high score one time, and keeping in mind that a high score on self-esteem is really, really high. <laughs> Low score is more like the middle of the scale somewhere. So people who had scored high on it at one point, and lower on it at another. And we could compare those unstable people to people who were either stably high or stably low. And as you might guess, our hypothesis was confirmed. There was an association between having unstable self-esteem and behaving violently or, or self-reported violent offending um, and hostility too. Um, yeah, just remembering, periodically remembering. Um, and that hung in after adjustment for confounding. So um, actually a way of using real world data to test a hypothesis that we had come up with just off the back of an envelope, I suppose, once upon a time in the 90s. Now, um, in 2010, we got a, um, an HRC uh, project grant to look at alcohol uh, use, problems with, associated with alcohol use in the cohort. And uh, one of the analyses that we wanted to undertake was the link between um, problems with alcohol and violent behavior. And the reason we wanted to do it, it seems like a no-brainer in a sense that, of course, we know that people who have problems with alcohol are more violent. But we really wanted to quantify this and, and estimate it as accurately as possible and also use these um, fixed effects models for controlling for non-observed confounding, which hadn't really been done in the literature previously. So, on this paper, we had data to age 30, and we looked at um, self-reported violent offending from age 17 to age 30, um, intimate partner violence perpetration, so physical intimate partner violence perpetration, also violence victimization, and physical intimate partner violence victimization. And as you can see, the people in the, in the group that was reporting the, the, the largest number of symptoms of alcohol use disorder, we used to call it alcohol abuse independence, we don't anymore. Um, the, most symptoms of alcohol use disorder had rates of violent offending that were over three and a half times higher than people who had no symptoms. And this is after adjustment for non-observed fixed confounding and time dynamic covariates. We also saw that they had rates of physical intimate partner violence perpetration that were more than two times higher than people who didn't have any alcohol problems, and rates of violence victimization that were almost twice as high as those who didn't have any alcohol problems. The last one didn't hang in there. So we can see that even after controlling for every sort of possible confounding that we could put in, um, it's clear that um, having problems with alcohol, which usually goes along with having a higher level of alcohol consumption, leads to more um, violent offend, self-reported violent offending, intimate partner violence, and victimization. But that's it for the crime, because I'm actually running perilously close <laughs> on time, I think. Um, one of the great things about this job, as opposed to being a, an experimental social psychologist 
working in the health field with real world longitudinal data is being able to become involved in policy. Um, a lot of researchers don't ever get to see what the, the value or the use of their research is. And if I had stayed doing theoretical models and things, I never would have either. But again, I got very lucky in being able to, to uh, be involved in this. And so the first time that I ever did this, um, that's a picture of the Legislative Council Chamber in Parliament House in Wellington. It is the former meeting place of the upper house of New Zealand's parliament, which voted to dissolve itself permanently in 1949. So the room was no, is no, longer, was no longer used for lawmaking, but instead for people giving talks and things like that. Um, and in 2006, I got invited to go up and speak at the Drugs Policy Roundtable, along with a number of other researchers. Um, in fact, I, I went up, um, David was meant to go, but he had kidney stones, and he said, I, I should go. Um, I was very nervous because I'd never given a talk in such an <laughs> important-seeming room before, but, but it was really a good experience for the first half of the day when we were all giving our talks. And then we had lunch, and then in the afternoon, um, Jim Anderton, who was the health minister at the time, got up, and, and, the, and the talks were all about cannabis and talking about reforming cannabis law. And he got up and he said, well, thank you all for your presentations and this information is all well and good, but we're not changing the law. <laughs> so that took the air out of the room. <laughs> now, poor Jim had some personal reasons for um, having this opinion, but um, a couple of years later, we had another opportunity. And the uh, first uh, Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, Sir Peter Gluckman, put together a panel of social science researchers with the task of creating a series of chapters, writing a series of chapters that present recommendations for how to improve the transition through life for young people. That is specifically the transition from childhood to adolescence and then adolescence to adulthood. What should we do? What policies should we adopt to help kids, especially those who are struggling and, and having a difficulty with the transition? Well, we actually prepared, David and I and Harleen Hain, prepared three chapters um, for this. Uh, first one on childhood conduct problems, which is largely derived from David's work from, in the advisory group for conduct problems um, in the last decade. Um, but also alcohol use in adolescence and cannabis use in adolescence. Now, I have no idea what sort of impact this had or, or didn't have. I do know that one of the things that came out after this, um, certainly uh, due to the advisory group on conduct problems, was a, a, an increase in, in some funding, but also the development of New Zealand-specific programs for kids and families um, who are at risk and with conduct problems. So we're not anywhere near being able to fully address these issues, um, but it, it, did go, it did go some way. I won't tell you too much about the next one because it was so disappointing. Um, you might remember the alcohol reform law that passed in 2012. Well, I was very involved in advocating for a number of very important reforms, none of which were in the finished law. Thank you, Crusher. <laughs> Yes, it was, it was Crusher who, who put paid to that. Um, so that was very disappointing. We'll have another run at it possibly after September. <laughs> but more recently, um, I've been involved with the Ministry of Justice in um, advising them in the development of the Cannabis Legalization and Control Bill. So what sort of things from a policy from research, what did researchers feel were the important things to address in terms of this policy and this, this law that's being developed. So myself and a number of other people, two of whom are in the room, um, were involved in this process. Um, but also at the same time being invited by the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, Juliet Gerard, and Doug was on the panel too, as you can see. Um, he probably can't see. <laughs> Um, being in, uh, invited to join the, the expert panel on cannabis. And our task was to create a public facing resource whereby a person could, and this is a website, it was launched on the 7th of July, 
where a person could take any particular issue that they're worried about with respect to the cannabis debate and actually be directed to the relevant research on this particular area about cannabis, cannabis-related harm, and cannabis law reform. And it's comprehensive, it has a frequently asked questions section, um, and I think it's a really um, valuable resource, and I was, I was quite proud to be a part of this group, which, which we're, our work is now concluded. So it has been a very interesting career. Um, I feel very privileged to be able to do, to do this kind of work, um, where I get to, well, I get to come into the office when I feel like it. <laughs> um, I don't have to punch a clock. I can think about things that I'm interested in, and there's always something new to think about or study, or, or, and it's, 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 it's endlessly fascinating. So I think probably was the right choice for me to do if I had to go back and do it all over again. Um, but honestly, I couldn't have done it without the support of many, many people. Um, first and foremost, my family, who are the ones here in the room, but also my family back in the States, um, who haven't got COVID yet, <laughs> um, thankfully. Um, and my friends and colleagues over the years who have made this a really stimulating and fascinating and challenging kind of work to do. And, and, and to my colleagues now who really make coming to work fun. So thank you all, most of the time. <laughs> um, and of course, um, all the people that I've had to poke and prod, whether it's been in the laboratory as a, as a graduate student um, or a Christchurch Health and Development Study um, participants who we, have, who we have poked and prod and we are now putting in an MRI machine. Um, and all those people without whom, without their time and generosity in providing this data wouldn't, we, we, to, to, to look at, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. And I'm really grateful um, to everyone for all their support over the years. Thank you very much. <laughs>